Even though Microsoft retired the MS600 exam and the associated MS600 developer certification in March 2023, you can still use the free self-paced resources that Microsoft provided to learn things like Office add-in development. In this video, I'm giving you my entire guide that walks you through these free resources, including lectures, hands-on labs, and videos. Hi, I'm Andrew Connell, and if you're new here, be sure to hit that subscribe button to stay up to date on all my videos for web and cloud developers on Microsoft 365 and related topics. And while you're at it, make sure you subscribe to my newsletter to get insights and the latest news in the world of Microsoft 365 for web and cloud developers. I've got a link to it here and the one in the description below. Before we get started with this, I want to set some context on what this video is going to cover. And while this only takes a moment, if you're familiar with the history of my MS600 exam prep course, feel free to use the chapter links in the description below to jump ahead to the start of this guide for self-paced learning on office add-in development. I've got chapters for everything. I created an exam prep course for the MS600 exam, Building Applications and Solutions with Microsoft 365 Core Services, that hundreds of developers had used to prepare for and pass the exam. Microsoft used the exam to measure a developer's knowledge around a few Microsoft 365 workloads, things like SharePoint, Microsoft Teams, Azure AD, Microsoft Graph, and Office add-ins. But when Microsoft retired the exam in March 2023, I was left with this course that served as a guide for all those free self-paced study resources that developers could use to prepare for the exam. I can't sell that. No one could buy, would buy that course, or more importantly, I can't in good conscience sell it because the exam doesn't exist anymore. But here's the thing, the course content is all still valid. It's a self-paced guide on how to learn various things, like what you need to know to be a qualified developer building Office add-ins. So I've decided to release the chapters for each of the different workloads here on my channel. That's what you're about to watch. Note that there are parts of the video where I refer to the exam. Just know that the exam, I'm referring to the MS600 exam. That's retired at this point and it's no longer available to take. Also throughout this video, I'm gonna reference a lot of online resources like documentation, training modules, videos, hands-on labs. The links are all in the video, but I've also compiled them in a single downloadable PDF. And you can get this from the link in the description below the video. It's all on my site. Okay, enough with the explanation out of the way. Let's dive into learning about the free self-paced resources for learning Office add-in development. Now the MS600 exam calls this workload extending Office, but it really encompasses just two different topics. The two topics it covers, the first one is Office add-ins. And now while you can build multiple types of add-ins for various Office apps, the exam really is only gonna test and focus on three of these different apps. It's gonna be Word, Excel, and Outlook. Now there's an honorable mention of PowerPoint, but you really just need to know what's possible and you don't really need to know much of the detail around it in terms of like how to do certain things because there's not gonna be many questions about PowerPoint on the exam. It's gonna focus primarily on Word, Excel, and Outlook. Now the other topic that is grouped into this workload is called adaptive cards. And what adaptive cards are, we need, you need to understand like you know what they are and what they're used for. And you're gonna see how they're used in Outlook uh, as something called uh, actionable messages. Now I'm gonna go into adaptive cards that are gonna be used in a different chapter when we talk about Microsoft Teams. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that in this chapter, but not a lot. I'm gonna focus primarily on how they're used in Outlook um, and just what adaptive cards are and what the technology is all about. Now, this workload, remember, this workload is only gonna account for about 15 to 20% of all of the questions in the pool of questions uh, for the exam. So this is not a, uh, one of the more uh, heavily emphasized sections uh, of the exam, like say Azure AD or Microsoft Graph or Teams is. Um, this is probably, I'd have to say out of all five of them, this is probably the weakest or the least important one, but still it's gonna make up 15 to 20% of the questions on the exam. So that covers the topics, but at what level do you need to know these different things that we're gonna talk about in this, in this uh, chapter here? What kind of depth do you need to have on each of these different topic areas that we're gonna run through? Now, recall Bloom's tex taxonomy from the overview chapter uh, in this course, and let's use that to provide a little bit of context 
around what you need to know. Because if you understand how deep you need to know something, it's gonna help you know, how you're gonna be tested. If you need to really know it, then you're gonna spend more time making sure you understand all the, nit, the, the nuts and bolts of it. Uh, but maybe you don't need to go that deep. Now, when you look at the skills worksheet that Microsoft provides with the MS600 exam, you're gonna notice that most skills are going to use the phrase or start with the phrase of describe or select. So what that means for extending office, that means that we're really focused primarily on the lower order thinking skills on Bloom's taxon uh, taxonomy. Um, the lowest one is remember. remember. That's about recalling facts and basic concepts. And it uses phrases like define and duplicate and list and memorize and repeat and state. Then the other one, the one right above that is called understand. And that's about understanding or explaining ideas and concepts. And it uses phrases like classify, select, describe, discuss, stuff like that. So these are really the level that you're going to need to know stuff. And it kind of shows you that you're at the lower order thinking and not higher order thinking. So you don't really have to get too, too deep in the extending office section. Now let's take a second and let's look at all the different lessons that I'm going to cover uh, in this chapter uh, so you can know what to expect. Now aside from this intro lesson, I'm going to also, uh, in just a minute, I'm going to talk a little bit about the additional learning resources that I've included uh, and reference in this chapter that you can use to go learn uh, more things about extending office. Okay. Um, we're then going to have a lesson on working on add-ins, uh, specifically around office add-ins. We've got a bunch of lessons on office add-ins. Um, the first one's going to be about working with the fundamental concepts or components in the different types of add-ins that are available to us. Um, and some of those will be specific to some office clients and some of them will be uh, shared across all office clients. Um, the next thing we'll look at is the Office JS API or the Office JavaScript API. Um, and we'll look at some of the common uh, things you need to understand about that. Um, then we're going to look at the different capabilities that we can do with add-ins. So what can we do inside of Word or Excel or Outlook? And I'm going to look at each one of those different apps in that lesson to kind of explain to you what things we can do in there. Um, and then we're going to look at you know, what the customizations op options are for us. What other things can we actually do with these different add-ins and talk about like UX customizations or authentication, um, stuff like that that we maybe want to, maybe would apply to um, all the different add-ins across all the uh, different Office clients. Um, and then finally, when we are kind of finished with the Office add-in stuff, the last thing I want to cover with Office add-ins is the, the questions and how you're going to get asked or what you're going to get uh, uh, measured on as it's related to testing your add-ins and debugging your add-ins and deploying your add-ins uh, for use by your customers. You need to understand that because there will be some questions on there that talk about you know, how you would actually go about building uh, these things and how would you go about uh, deploying them and testing them if you ran into problems. And then finally, as I said a minute ago, we're going to have another lesson that's going to deal with something called Outlook Actionable Messages and understand a little bit about what adaptive cards are. Uh, and I'll explain what those are. And we're going to focus on those, what the adaptive cards technology is, and then specifically using them inside of Outlook for actionable messages. And as I said a minute ago, in a different chapter, we'll focus on uh, how we can use adaptive cards in Microsoft Teams. Now, like a lot of the other chapters that you're going to find in this course, I'm keeping the depth at the level of explaining what topics you need to know I'm trying not to go too deep in the course because there's a lot of resources that are out there and this is an exam prep course. It's not trying to teach you everything. Now, when I cover something, you know, you may look at it and say, okay, yeah, I'm pretty good here. I don't need to, I understand what that is uh, in, in a lot of depth. But if you think to yourself, uh, what? I don't get it. Or if you're not familiar with an API or how to do something that I'm talking about in one of these lessons, you probably should go read up on the docs or study one of the recommended re resources that uh, and references that I'm going to provide um, to make sure that you are adequately prepared for the exam. Now, I'm, I'm going to reference some specific areas in one place, uh, or I'll reference these different resources in different areas of the course. I just want to go over like one master list right here to you know, explain everything that I'm giving you and that, I've, that I'm pulling together for you. Um, and that you may want to reference um, in just one spot. Now, in the notes that accompany this lesson, as are all, as with all the other lessons in this chapter and the other chapters, 
Um, I've included links to each of these things. So they're not in the video, but if you look in the lesson notes, uh, I'll put them in the lesson notes and that's to make sure too, if links change, I can easily update that stuff uh, for you. Now, the first group of links is gonna be around Microsoft Learning. And what Microsoft Learning has is they've got two different things. They've got learning paths and modules. And what a learning path is, is a collection of multiple modules strung together of, that you need to, you would say need to learn all of this stuff to be able to do something. So if you wanted to learn how to, you know, say do all the stuff with the extending office um, uh, workload, or if you wanted to learn how to go build something for Azure, they'll have a learning path with a bunch of modules in it. Now the module that we have, or the learning path that we have for extending office is called extend office clients with office add-ins dash associate. Now this includes a handful of modules that uh, are just gonna walk you through creating add-ins for each of the three primary products. Uh, Microsoft Word, Microsoft Excel, and Microsoft Outlook. Now there's a bunch of modules that are also um, provided here. These are a few of the modules that, that don't fit really necessarily within this learning path. There's a couple that I have in here in this list as well. The three that you see called Build Office uh, Add-ins with Word, Excel, and Outlook, those are the three that are in that learning path um, at the top of the slide. The other ones that you see there about um, an introduction to the Office Client customization with add-ins, um, that's kind of like an intro to things that you could do with Office add-ins. Um, that goes in a little more depth of the stuff that I'm going to cover in this chapter, but I've covered everything that you don't really need to use that one. I'm just letting you know that it's there. I'm going to make sure that all that's kind of covered in this, in this chapter. Um, the um, uh, so the other ones that you see there, those three build ones, those are good to go do like deep dives if you need to learn uh, additional stuff uh, for those specific areas. Um, then there's two that are about uh, act adaptive cards and actionable messages. There's one on creating and one's about understanding. The understanding one is a little more uh, overview and kind of more basic, and it focuses primarily on actionable messages, not so much adaptive cards. And you'll see in the last lesson kind of what the relationship is between these, but just know that that's kind of like the intro module. And then the one that's a little bit deeper is the one that's called create engaging messages with adaptive cards. That's the one that is gonna go a little bit more in depth and includes hands-on labs for uh, creating um, uh, adaptive cards and then using them in Outlook and then also using them in um, Microsoft uh, Teams. Now, I'm also including a bunch of documentation uh, links here for around specific topics. If you wanna go further with your education, some things you're gonna need to know for the exam, some things you don't need to know. Um, but there's some stuff like uh, extending each of the Office products with different add-ins. I've got the documentation for where you can go find those docs, not just the MS Learn stuff, but the reference stuff for Microsoft Docs. Um, you've also got things like uh, common add-in topics like testing, debugging, deploying. I'm going to go through some of that stuff in the chap in the course. Uh, but as a, again, ex uh, it's an exam prep. So if you haven't done that before and you need to go learn it, those are the docs on where you need to go learn that stuff. Um, and then also like things like, you know, how are you going to handle different authentication scenarios uh, is another one that you need to do. And then finally, I've included a, a few links in the Microsoft Docs on adaptive cards and Outlook at, um, uh, actionable messages uh, as well. So in the next lesson, we're going to go dive into what the different Office add-ins are and some fundamental concepts and different types of add-ins that are available to us. So I'll see you in the next lecture. In this lesson, we're gonna talk about the fundamental components and different types of Office add-ins that you need to be aware of because you're gonna get tested on these on the MS600 exam. Now, Office add-ins are implemented as web applications and some types, such as task panes and content panes, they're full-blown web apps. Um, while other types of customizations like custom functions and commands, these are single script files that are hosted and loaded from an external web app. The exam is going to test you on your knowledge on the different types of add-ins and their capabilities. So let's take a moment in this lesson and let's look at the different types of add-ins that are uh, available to us to create as a developer. So let's look at some of the most common types of add-ins. Um, and this is the task pane add-in. So this is going to enable user interaction via a panel that's displayed within an office client application. And it's enabling users to modify documents or emails or view data from other data sources um, while you're inside of the Office uh, client. Now, the different supported types that we have or supported apps uh, that we have to be able to create 
uh, task pane add-ins include Word, Excel, PowerPoint, um, and Outlook. Now these add-ins can use the Office JS API, which I'm gonna cover in a later lesson, to interact with the document, workbook, spreadsheet, presentation, message, appointment, you name it. Um, whatever's open inside the Office client application. Because our add-in can't talk directly to a document, we have to go through the Office JS API, and we're gonna look at that in another lesson. From a developer point of view, you're gonna implement this by creating a web app that's hosted in a location that you control. Um, a manifest file is, going to, is something I'm gonna cover in another lesson, but what that does is it describes the add-in to the hosting client um, application and includes the URL of the web app in the add-in. And when the Office application activates the task pane add-in, the URL of the web app is loaded within the panel in the margin of the document or whatever current uh, item is open in the context of the hosting app. And you can see that from the screenshot that I have there um, on the slide. You can see I've got a document open in Word, and on the right-hand side, I have a task pane that is just gonna allow me to click different buttons to add content uh, to my Word document. Now, the way you define your add-in is in the manifest, and here you set the Office app uh, element, XML element. Uh, you set his type attribute equal to something like the task pane app or mail app, depending on the office client where you wanna make this available. Now another type of add-in is the content add-in. The content add-in is used to insert an object into a spreadsheet or a presentation. And you're, this object is gonna be a web-based uh, web -based data or web-based uh, uh, structure um, that is going to be shown inside of this frame. And it can be like a data visualization or some media or some other content like Maybe you're gonna show a map from Bing Maps or Google Maps. This is supported in both Excel and in, out, in um, uh, PowerPoint uh, for your applications. Now, from a developer point of view, um, it works the same way, really, as, an, as a task pane add-in. You're gonna implement this by creating a web app that's hosted in a location that you own. Um, and a manifest file, uh, which, again, I'll cover later, is what's going to include the URL and tell office where to, what the URL is of the web app to go load inside of that content uh, pane that you're going to be adding to your spreadsheet or your presentation. When it loads the add-in, when Office loads the add-in, the URL of the web app is going to be loaded within a panel in the current item uh, in the spreadsheet of the presentation of the client application. And you can see there that you indicate what this is uh, by saying it's a content app um, inside the type attribute of the Office app in the manifest, and it's supported for both Excel uh, and PowerPoint. Now, let's look at some fundamental extensibility components that these are things that are either used in all your add-ins or you can use in optionally in just some add-ins. So these are not specific to any Office application or any specific extensibility type. So the Office add-ins XML manifest is gonna define the settings and capabilities in the add-in. This manifest file, every single add-in has to have one of these. You can configure it to control how your add-in is rendered and behaves in the target Office applications. So what kinds of things does it contain? It contains metadata, so some details about the application, like its name, description, version, ID. Um, how it's gonna integrate with Office, what's the target hosting app, is it, it does it have add-in commands like buttons on the ribbon, um, and some other functionality things. What are its permissions? Uh, what's the location of the images we're gonna use for the add-in's branding? Um, in the case of Outlook, you know, what is the height of the add-in? What rules should activate it? Uh, if it's a content add-in, what are the default dimensions that it should be shown uh, in the document? And the way that this is used is that the Office client is gonna use it to understand what your add-in does. So like, is it a task pane, a content pane, et cetera. And when you publish, the other way it's used is that when you publish your app to AppSource, that's Microsoft's enterprise store, the details of, of, are gonna be used to create an entry that's displayed uh, to your customers uh, inside of AppSource. It's validating the manifest and it validates that it runs on all the different expected platforms um, as well. Now let's talk about dialog. So a dialog is used to display or collect information about your users. So some common scenarios are prompting a user to log in, um, either to a Microsoft service or to a third party service like Salesforce. 
um, maybe to confirm a user action or to run a task that may require you know some sort of a configuration like you may need to put some settings in before you actually can go do something um, this uh, screenshot you see here is uh, showing a dialog that's popping up um, that contains the Microsoft sign-in process. Now, one thing to keep in note is that dialogs are not modal, which means a user can interact with the hosting office app and the, and the document itself or whatever thing you have open while the dialog is active. Okay, so don't assume that it's, it, they have to get through the dialog. This is available in Word, Excel, PowerPoint, and in Outlook. Um, the other thing that we have is, a, is another type of uh, extensibility we can create is something called a custom function. And what a custom function is, is a JavaScript or a TypeScript file that can be used as a, um, as a function inside of Microsoft Excel. Like we have some of the built-in ones called like Sum. Um, this is available in Windows and Mac OS Excel and the Web Excel, provided that you are logged in to your Microsoft 365 subscription, both in the desktop clients and in the web client. So it's only going to be available to you if you're logged in. Now I'm going to take a look at these more in a later lesson. Uh, so we can see a little bit more detail about these. But here's what one looks like, just as a little bit of a teaser here. Um, what this is, you can see it's a JavaScript function that's got some special um, comments uh, in the header for it. So that's the those comments that you see there. Those That's called JS doc. And one of them there that says custom function, you need that. That's going to be required. You can see that once it's been registered and deployed inside of Excel and that animation that you see to the right, I'm able to then use that function inside of a formula uh, inside of my Microsoft Excel uh, spreadsheet or workbook. Now, the last thing I wanna to touch on really here is about commands. And an add-in command, this is a UI element that's gonna extend the Office UI and it's gonna um, give us like a start action for our add-in. And you can use this add-in command to add a button to the ribbon or an item to the context menu or any of those kinds of things. And when a user, when a user selects an add-in command, they're gonna initiate actions such as running JavaScript code or showing a page um, of the add-in uh, in a task pane. And that add-in commands are gonna help users find and use your add-in, which that can really help increase um, your add-in's adoption and reuse and really improve customer retention. You're going to use them in the ribbon or in the command um, overflow section uh, for uh, Word, Excel, PowerPoint, uh, OneNote, and Outlook. So here you can see we've got uh, a couple buttons that are showing up in the task in the ribbon at the top. And whatever I click on, it's going to be able to interact or control what's going on in my task pane. Here you can see in the manifest what that looks like. You got a bunch of XML for different extension points. And the different types is where I'm defining where this can show up. So the primary command surface, that's the general ribbon that you're going to see in um, Word, Excel, PowerPoint, and OneNote. Um, when you see it says context menu, that's going to be showing up in, a, um, uh, in the context menu of, a, of an item. Um, and then in Outlook, we have two different modes, and then each mode has two different settings or two different sub-modes. Uh, you've got when you're working with a message or an email, um, you have, you're either in read mode or you're in compose mode. Uh, and then when you're looking at an appointment, you're either in read mode, which is I'm an attendee, or you're in compose mode, which is I'm the organizer of the meeting. So that's where you can define where these different things will um, appear. Um, there is a lab associate. I'm not going to go through too much more and too much depth in, on commands um, in this chapter. Uh, if you haven't worked with these and you need some experience doing this, um, I would recommend that you take a look at the hands-on lab associated with the Outlook uh, module that I'm going to refer to, um, that I referred to both in the first lesson of this chapter, but I'm also going to add um, as uh, a note that accompanies this lesson. So look in the lesson notes for that. Um, when it comes to building add-ins, task pane add-ins, uh, content add-ins, and um, the other type that we talked about in this lesson called um, uh, custom functions, uh, as well as dialogues, um, all of those things are also in various different hands-on labs that I will reference uh, in the notes that accompany this lesson as well. It's all the same ones that are referred to as the Microsoft Learning uh, Details uh, modules that I talked about in the first lesson as well in this chapter. So in the next lesson, we're going to leave add-ins and we're going to talk about the Office JavaScript API, what's also known as Office JS. So I will see you in the next lesson. 
In this lesson, we are going to focus on the Office JavaScript API or Office JS API. Um, and I'm also going to talk about some of the development tools here. So this is more about like, how am I going to get in and actually work with uh, my um, uh, creating an add-in uh, and an extending uh, Microsoft Office. So the Office JavaScript API, which is commonly just referred to as Office JS, um, this is used to interact with objects and client objects or client apps uh, in Office. Now it really consists of two primary object models. You've got a common API. Um, this was introduced in Office 2013. And what this does is this allows you or enables you to access features such as dialogues, UI, uh, client settings common that are common across multiple types of Office apps, um, a couple of those different things. But really, the, the big piece here is that giving you like dialogues and stuff like that, the things that you're gonna use across all the different Office clients. Then you have some host-specific APIs. Um, we have host-specific APIs for Excel uh, and Word. And what these do is they provide strongly typed objects that you can use to access specific elements in the host application. So like for example, the Excel API contains objects that represent worksheets and ranges and tables and charts and a whole lot more stuff um, as well. You can refer to the notes associated with this lesson uh, for links on each of the different APIs, including the Common API, the Word API, the Excel API, the Outlook API, and the PowerPoint API. Now let's talk about what the programming model looks like here. Well, how are we gonna need, what are we gonna need to know about this for the MS600 exam? Well, the first step is that you're gonna have to add the OfficeJS library to your web app that implements the add-in. Um, and when you do that, that's gonna be done by inserting uh, a reference to a JavaScript file in the head of your web app. Um, as you can see here in the code, then just this uh, JavaScript example here, is I've got two different script references. One is for the V1 endpoint, or the V1 library, and one is for the beta library. So the V1, it's always updated to always have access to the latest. You can uh, specify a specific version if you want to do that, but it's not recommended. It's always recommended you use latest. But then you've also got um, an option where you can use the beta endpoint as well. You're gonna add this to your web app that's implementing your Office add-in. Now, once you've gone through and you've created your, your HTML page, it's gonna contain uh, the um, add-in implementation and you've got that script reference in, the next thing that you're gonna have to do, your add-in has to do is it has to respond to the hosting Office client app within five seconds to say, I'm ready, I've been, I've been initialized. Um, if you don't do this, Outlook or Word or Excel or whatever Office app it is, it's going to display an error. And so if it's a task pane, it's gonna show like the ASP.yellow screen of death. It's going to, it's gonna present something to the user to let them know that Outlook isn't the thing that's having a problem, it's this extensibility piece that is. So you have to respond within five seconds of this being called. Now the way that you're gonna do that is you're gonna implement a method called office.onready. And you're going to just make sure that you implement that method and then uh, it completes within five seconds. Like I said, failure to do this, it's gonna display an error. So in the code that you see here, this is a quick little example that I've got the office.ready function running. This is saying that office is now initialized and now my add-in is being initialized. And when that happens, I then can get access to whatever I need to get access to. Like for example, this is saying that, hey, your web app that's implementing your task pane has been loaded. And now I would have access to using something like say jQuery and his ready function, if I wanted to use jQuery in mine. Now let's talk about the requirements of the hosting application. There's a couple things you need to do. The add-in itself can't control specifics about the Office client that it's hosted in. I mean, you can say that this is for Word or this is for Excel, but I can't say that Word has to be able to do these three things. Um, I also can't do it for like defining the platform. Like, is it in? Is, are my own Windows? Am I on Mac? Am I on what? Am, am I web? Um, you also need to think about like you know what version of Office JS does it support because different. Office client apps support different Office JS uh, APIs or, or versions. Um, the APIs and features that are supported, that can vary between the version of Office that you have installed. 
And so one of the things that you want to be able to do is that you want to have a way to be able to check and say, to essentially ask the Office client, do you support this? And the way that Office does this is it implements something called a requirement set. And so what you're going to do in the requirement set is you can check to see, you know, if office.context.requirements, you can ask it, is this support, is this the set that I'm giving you, is it supported? And I can pass in either the required set name, or I, not either, but I pass in the required set name and optionally the minimum version uh, that would be supported. And then if it is supported, then my code would run. So I could have that if else statement to provide certain functionality to someone who say has the latest version of Word installed and has the latest features, but then I can have a graceful fallback if the user has an older version of Word installed and doesn't have access to those same features because they weren't in the older version. Now, let's talk about how your code runs inside of an Office add-in. Um, you need to know how add-ins are executed and how you're gonna interact with the Office app when you're using something like Office JS. Now, your code is gonna run in a sandboxed JavaScript environment, um, and that environment can't directly access the Office app, the document, spreadsheet, presentation, email, calendar event, whatever other Office type that we're in, you can't access that thing directly. So instead, what's gonna happen is that Office JS gives us these proxy objects that represent documents, and these are called request contexts. It's usually just referenced as just context that you'll see in the, um, in the code. Now to use the data inside of a context, what, just because you're given a context doesn't mean you have access to all the properties on the current document that's loaded in the page, on the, in Word. Instead, what you have to do is that you have to go ask Office JS to say, I need, I need the values of these properties on this context object or on the document. And so what you do is you use this load method to kind of queue up a list of all the properties that you're going to need. And then once you have those, you're going to call this method sync. And what that's going to do is that's going to tell Office JS to go to, to, to Word and to go grab all those properties and then hydrate them inside the Office um, API. Inside, here's an example of using this inside of Excel. So Excel uses this concept of Excel.run. And you can see that the run that's being passed in, I'm, it's giving me a callback, but it's giving me a reference to the context. That's the request context. Now, when it comes to Excel, the context is going to give me access to the current workbook that I'm in and maybe getting the selected range. So if I've got a bunch of cells that are selected inside of the spreadsheet, that's going to give me that selected range. Well, I need to know where that range is. And that property is the address property. Well, the, that address property is not hydrated on that object. And so what I'm going to have to tell it to do is say, I need you to go load the address property or go hydrate it. Then when I call run, uh, return, or sorry, when I call context.sync, that's going to return a promise that I can then, once it resolves and once it finishes hydrating that property, to where I can then go access the address property on the selected range, as you see here um, on this slide. Okay, now let's take a look at some of the development tooling and the debugging options that you have when creating a custom Office um, add-in. Now the exam's not gonna test you on actually creating stuff. You're not gonna be, it's not gonna ask you to say, go create an add-in that does these three things. But you are gonna be tested on what tools are available to you and what uh, options you would have, and what scenarios they'd make the most sense. Just like in the last one, you need to understand how the API works because you may be given a code snippet and be, have to explain what it does or which one of the code snippets is valid for an ex, uh, saying that you, know, you need something that does this, it does you know, whatever it defines. That, those kinds of things will be on the exam. So developers can choose from multiple different um, development options uh, when you wanna go build an add-in. Um, first option that you have here is Visual Studio. So what Visual Studio is, this, is, this option is gonna be used to create add-ins for developers on Windows if you also want to have a C-sharp or Visual Basic based backend, like a .NET based backend. What I mean by that, if you want to run server-side code. Now, it's running in your environment, remember, not running inside of Office. This is used to create add-ins for Word, Excel, PowerPoint, and um, Outlook. The other option that you have is something called the Yeoman Generator for Office add-ins. And what's nice about this one is this is cross-platform. So you can use this 
if you're developing on on uh, a Windows machine or on Mac OS or on Linux, it, it doesn't really matter. Any, it works everywhere. Um, the Yeoman generator, uh, when you do this, it's also going to assume you're using a Node.js based backend. So a Node.js uh, based uh, uh, web server uh, to run your server side code. Um, if you wanted to use a different technology, then you totally you can totally do that. Just remove the node node piece to it. You can add in, um, like say, using .NET or .NET Core or ASP.NET Core. All that stuff is still an option for you. Um, but Node.js is what is is what the the out of the box uh, one is is based on. You won't be asked on the exam to use Yeoman and .NET at the same time. They won't. It doesn't it doesn't walk you through that kind of a, a request. Um, this is going to be available, or this is going to be useful to create add-ins for a lot more types than what we can do with Visual Studio, including uh, OneNote and um, Project um, as well. Now, there are some complementary tools, not just Visual Studio and uh, the Yeoman Generator. And oh yeah, I forgot to mention on the last slide that when it, when we talk about the Yeoman Generator, you are you just need a text editor, and that generally is going to be VS Code. All right, you're generally going to use VS Code for that. The other thing too that you'll see is that there are some things that are getting installed when you use the Yeoman generator as well. And that's some of these complementary tools. Um, one tool that is going to be is very useful, and this is good for like prototyping what you want to do with Office JS. It's called Script Lab. And what this is, is a task pane that will install in Word, Excel, or PowerPoint. It's like a custom add-in. Um, and it really gives you like a little uh, code environment where you can uh, try out your Office JS uh, code to go work with the current document. So it's a great way to test out your your uh, your stuff that you're going to write for your add-in without having to go through all of the extra overhead of creating the manifest and creating the web app and and adding the Office JS reference. You don't have to do any of that stuff. All that stuff is done for you. Um, now this is again, this is just good for like prototyping because you're going to have to take that code out of Script Lab and you're going to shove it into your add-in that you have done all that stuff for. The other thing that we have is a thing called a, a, a manifest validator, and what this is, it's, it's going to examine your manifest to make sure that everything is complete that needs to be there and that it's all correct. Um, this is included with projects that are created with the Yeoman generator that I just talked about uh, a minute ago. Um, but if you don't, if you chose to use Visual Studio, then it's just a Node.js based tool. So you just have to have Node installed and then you install um, the Office um, add-in manifest validator and then you run the validator and pass in um, the uh, path to the manifest file and it will go through and validate uh, that for you. Okay, so that's a lot of like the common stuff with add-ins and the development tooling and some of the common tools that we can have access to. Um, now that we've understood all of those things, the next thing we want to start to get into is the specific capabilities of each one of the Office clients, like Word, Excel, and Outlook, the things that the exam is going to test you on. So I will see you in the next lesson. Now, in this lesson, uh, I'm going to take a look at what you need to know about each of the different Office client apps that you're going to be tested on, specifically the capabilities around Word, Excel, and um, Outlook. Let's start with Microsoft Excel. This is probably the most robust one and also the most complicated one. Um, Outlook coming in a close second. So again, Microsoft Excel, um, the API that we have for um, Excel JS is probably the most robust API of the entire part of the Office JS API. Um, it's going to allow us to create and manage charts and graphs inside of worksheets. Now, we can create task panes with in, in Excel, and we can also create content uh, pane add-ins inside of Excel. And the kinds of things that we can do with this are things like um, managing content and formatting and structure of a workbook uh, or a spreadsheet. We can also add, update, and set values inside of cells and create tables and ranges. Now, if you're not familiar with the Office Excel API, I'm going to refer you to the, the um, notes that accompany this lesson for a link to the Microsoft documentation on it. I'd also strongly recommend that you uh, go through the hands-on lab and uh, that I've uh, provided in the, um, uh, in the Associated Microsoft Learning um, Excel module uh, that contains some stuff that you're going to end up doing with um, Excel. You end up creating a, um, you create a task pane 
that creates uh, the, actually what you see there on the screen, on, on, that, on the picture on the screen there on the slide. Um, what you create is you, you create a, uh, a table of data and then you fill it with data and you're gonna go fetch like stock quotes and stuff um, to go update that data inside of that spreadsheet. But you're doing all of your work from the task pane. So you get to see a really good way of how to implement one of these. Now, another thing that we can do with Excel is a custom function. These only apply to Excel. And the way that these work, these are custom JavaScript or TypeScript uh, functions that are used as um, an Excel function that's available to us. So the way it works is that this is gonna be loaded inside of an HTML page, um, and it's gonna contain another script reference uh, to the uh, custom function runtime. Um, this is, this is, you need this runtime because it's going to give you access to Excel, not just Office JS, but it's going to give you access uh, to Excel. Um, unlike other types of add-ins though, it only runs JavaScript. You have no access to things like the, the browser DOM or the page DOM. Um, so you can't do things with like with jQuery, um, nor can you Office, the, um, Office JS to interact with the document um, itself. itself. Um, you can, you can share information with a task pane um, in the app, um, but you can't talk directly to each, they can't talk directly to each other. They have to go through this runtime to do that. Um, one way that you can do this though, to be able to, so they can talk to each other, is that you can use this storage API that's available to us from the custom function runtime and from Office JS to be able to um, share information back and forth. Why would you need to do that? Well, a common um, scenario for this is that if the task pane had the user log in and they, when they logged in, they, the task pane obtained an access token to some other endpoint, it could store that access token in as a setting and then your custom function could use that access token to go uh, call some third party service and show the data uh, in that way. Now let's look at Microsoft Outlook, which is one of the three primary Office apps Exam's gonna test you on. You don't need to know all the details about the API, but you do need to know how it works and the capabilities that it has. So what kind of capabilities do we have with Office JS? Well, we can work with task panes. Now these are gonna to apply to both the read and compose version of messages or email and events. And when you think about it, read is for an email is like, the email's been sent to you. So I'm looking at an email, I'm not writing an email. Um, and when it comes to a meeting, when I'm looking at it, I'm an attendee. If I'm in the write mode, like compose mode for an email, I'm actually drafting an email. But if I'm in the compose mode for a meeting, well, I'm the organizer. I, I'm the one that's actually able to make edits to it and make changes to it. Um, now, there is something that's very specific to Outlook, a type of add-in that is not available anywhere else and that's called a contextual add-in. And what this is, is this is gonna activate based on text that is found in the message or in the appointment. So think like if you had like a shipping tracking number or a mailing address um, that was found inside of an email. What this does is you are allowed, it, it enables you to automatically load your add-in between the header part of the email and the body of the email where maybe you show an address or details on the shipment of where it currently is. Um, these can be activated also via regular expressions. And these can be activated via regular expressions as well um, or a known type. These known types are things like phone numbers, email addresses, contacts, um, an address, or a meeting suggestion. Those are things that are native to Outlook and the Outlook JS but you can also use a regular expression to find stuff um, as well. The other type of add-in, uh, here's an example of it too, where you can see uh, it found a address uh, inside of our email, so one Microsoft way, and it's popping up um, that Bing map uh, inside of the, the email where I can see the, the details of it popping up and being activated. Okay, another type of uh, add-in that is only available to us in, in Outlook is a module. And what a module is, Think about this, well, easiest to just show you. So think about this as like mail is a module inside of Outlook, calendar is a module, tasks is a module, Ca contacts or people is a, is a module. In this case here, you can see that I've created one called billable hours and it's taking over the entire screen. 
I've got a couple commands in the ribbon um, that you can see up there for, for the billing rates. Um, but you can see here that I, I have a bunch of more information showing up um, inside of Outlook, inside this module here. Now, let's talk a little bit about authentication because when it comes to Outlook add-ins, you're really, you're frequently working with uh, user information or needing to get user information uh, inside of one of these Outlook uh, item types. So Outlook is a tool where you're working with the current user's information. The information is gonna re probably reside in Microsoft services that are frequently accessible via the Microsoft Graph. But in many cases, the data may reside in other services like Salesforce or Google or many others. So regarding or regardless of where it is to get to that data, you're going to need to your add in to have some sort of uh, an authentication uh, request, uh, an authenticated request to one of these different endpoints. So let me show you. Let me talk about some of the different options that are available to you. Um, if you're not familiar with these, I would encourage you to use the documentation links that I'm including in the notes that accompany this lesson in this chapter to learn more because you need to know these different scenarios and uh, you, on, for the exam, you need to know the different scenarios and when you would use each one of these in those different scenarios. Uh, so make sure you read up on this stuff. Um, there are multiple options um, that are available to us depending on the different scenarios. So the first one is using what's called the Exchange User Identity Token. And this is a way for us, the add-in to establish the identity of the user. When you use this option, you authenticate the user once and accept their identity token as the authorization for all future requests. Now you do this by calling a method called get user identity token async. And that's gonna give you the exchange user identity token. And this is gonna be useful when you are, uh, or it's primarily useful when you're working with exchange on-prem or when you need access to a non-Microsoft service that you have control over. So not really the best option when you wanna do something like uh, with uh, like Microsoft Graph. Now another option you can do is getting an access token. You're gonna to get that from an OAuth2 uh, flow. This is not really specific to Outlook. This actually applies to all add-ins. But the add-in is gonna prompt the user to sign into to a service using what the method called display dialog async method to initialize the OAuth2 flow. This is gonna be really useful or it's gonna be ideal uh, when you need access to third-party services that support OAuth2 for authentication. You're gonna to wanna to use this when you are calling a service that's outside of your control. That's a big use case of when you're gonna to wanna to use this. Another option is something called the callback token. Now this is gonna give you your add-in access to the user's mailbox from your server, either via the Exchange Web Services or the REST API. And you're gonna get this by, uh, get the token by calling the get callback token async method from the mailbox object. Um, the access level that's controlled by the, that you get your token can do, like what access it has, is controlled by the permissions that are specified in the add-in manifest. Now, one thing I do wanna mention is there is another option here called the SSO token, the single sign-on token. This is possible, and if you're interested, you can definitely go read up on the docs on it, and I, I've added it as a, as a reference to the notes for this lesson and the entire chapter, but you're not gonna be tested on it. Um, it was not covered in the exam uh, as, and it, because it wasn't added to OfficeJS until 2020, when the exam was created in 2019, and it was also not part of the November 2020 exam refresh. So if you want to see how to do this with the SSO token, that's great for a uh, great option for you, but you're not going to be tested on it because it didn't exist when the test was created. Okay, now let's look at Microsoft Word, which is the, the last of the three primary Office apps that the MS600 exam is going to test you on. You don't need to know all the details about the API, but you do need to know how it works and the capabilities of the API. All right, so the WordJS API, what kinds of things can we do with this? Well, it supports two different kinds of Office add-ins, the Task Pane add-in and the Content Pane add-in. It's used to manage content and formatting of the structure um, of a document. Those are the big things we're gonna end up using this for. Some of the scenarios are, say, working with document text and searching for content within the actual document. Now, one of the things you need to understand is, is how the API is structured. 
So the way the IPA API is structured is that the Word JS API is going to give you access to two things, a body and a section. The body contains things like one or more paragraphs, one or more tables, one or more lists, texts, objects like images, stuff like that. A section is going to give you access to the section's body or the section's headers or footers. So you know you can change like the header and footer for a section of the document. That's where you get access to the section. If you're not familiar with the Word API, you need to refer to the notes that accompany this lesson for a link to the Microsoft documentation on it. And you might want to just go scroll through it, make sure you have a, a good understanding um, of what's there in terms of the pieces that I just talked about a moment ago. There's also a good um, hands-on lab associated uh, with uh, a couple of hands-on labs actually that are associated uh, with Word, the Word uh, JS API in the Microsoft Learning uh, module on building Office add-ins uh, for Word. So make sure you take a look at the notes uh, that accompany this lesson for a link to that learning path or that, that module. Um, and I also referenced it in the overall one uh, in the first lesson as well. Okay, so let's conclude this lesson by a look at what you need to know about PowerPoint. And you may get some questions on the exam about PowerPoint, but this is by far the least important of all the Office products that are covered on the exam. And in fact, you, you may get very, you may not even get a question about PowerPoint. It may just be, there's just a few in the pool. So what can we do with the PowerPoint JavaScript API? Well, it really supports two different types of add-ins, task panes and content add-ins, very much like Excel. Now, the API is gonna give us the ability to get details about the current presentation and the current and all the slides inside the presentation. And it's also gonna allow us to both add and delete slides from the presentation um, as well. Uh, if you're not familiar with the PowerPoint API, again, just like the other ones, I've got a link to uh, it inside the, uh, the notes that accompany this lesson to the documentation that accompanies it. Um, we don't have any, uh, there's no Microsoft learning module about PowerPoint. So you can, from that, you can kind of get a feel of how important this really is to the exam. I would at least just scroll through it just to kind of have a, a basic knowledge of what you can do with this thing. Now let's take a moment and explore how single sign-on authentication works with Office add-ins. Office add-in support for SSO late in 2020. Now in the add-in, you're going to make a JavaScript call using the Office JS API to a method. And this is going to tell the Office client app to obtain an access token or really an ID token for the add-in uh, that's going to be coming from Azure AD. Now, if the user isn't already signed in, the Office client application is going to open a pop-up window for the user to sign in. And if this is the first time that the user has used your add-in, they're going to have to be prompted for consent. And furthermore, they may have to go through uh, step-up authentication, such as multi-factor auth, if that's required by, the, by your tenant. The Office client application is going to then request the ID token for the current user from the Azure AD endpoint. And Azure AD is going to send that ID token back to the Office client application. The Office client app is then going to send the ID token to the add-in as part of the resulting object returned by the get access token call. JavaScript in the add-in can then parse the token and extract the information it needs, such as the user's email address or their object ID. Now it's worth noting that none of the Office applications can request an access token that can be used to call other endpoints such as Microsoft Graph. It can only request the ID token with a profile permission. If the add-in needs to call another API, it needs to exchange the ID token with Azure AD using the OAuth2 on behalf of Flow to obtain an access token. And once the tab has this token, it can include it in the request to Microsoft Graph. Now, in the next lesson, we are going to talk about Office uh, add-in customization. So how can I do things with like uh, getting settings or saving my settings? Um, how can I do UI customizations? And then another really popular one too is um, working with some of the, uh, Microsoft Graph to, use, to integrate that into my application. So there's some little, we're not gonna dive into Graph, but little nuances there. So I'll see you in the next lesson where we talk about that stuff. In this lesson, let's look at some of the customization options that are available to developers for building Office add-ins. And this includes things like customizing the user experience, how to persist state and settings for your add-in, and what options are available to you there, and then how do you work with data via the Microsoft Graph. Not gonna dive into Microsoft Graph and all the stuff you can do with it, 
just how we can use it in the context of an Office add-in. There's a whole nother chapter about Microsoft Graph that you need to know as one of the primary workloads in the exam. So we're not gonna go that deep in it in this lesson. Let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so let's first talk about persisting state and settings in Office add-ins. Office JS is gonna include multiple options for persisting the state and settings, um, but it's really gonna depend on the Office application that we're using, um, that we're targeting, and the type of add-in on what options are going to be available to us. Um, the Office add-ins platform provides several ways for your add-in to persist state and settings. And again, they're gonna depend on a couple of different scenarios, the client that you're in and the type of add-in you're creating. The Office JS API is gonna provide you uh, your, your, your provide objects for your add-in to save state across different scenarios. So here's some of the options that are available to us depending on the add-in types. So all add-ins can use the HTML web storage or other techniques available to us via the add-in for underlying the browser, uh, browser control. This is things like the browser local storage, cookies, and etc. because they're all running inside of a browser. It's just inside of the Office client. Um, the mail apps uh, for like say Outlook, these you can have access to things called custom properties, which are stored on a message or an appointment inside the add-in, or you have access to roaming settings. And the roaming settings, um, these are gonna be stored in the user's exchange mailbox and associated with an add-in uh, as well. Um, so that they'll, they'll persist between devices. Um, a content app, which is available in Word and Excel and PowerPoint, um, you have an option for storing settings with the document or the workbook or the presentation itself. And when it comes to a task pane app, you've got the same options you have in, in the content add-in, so same settings option, but you also have these things called custom XML parts. And this is data that's gonna be stored in a custom XML portion of the document or workbook. Uh, and like for example, in Excel uh, or Word, you're gonna use the Excel and Word Office JS APIs, the specific APIs, to work with these different settings. Um, again, refer to a specific uh, hands-on lab for saving settings uh, for, um, and uh, one of the Microsoft Learning modules uh, that I'm gonna reference here in the notes that accompany uh, this, this module or this lesson. Now, Microsoft's Office UI Fabric Library, which was recently renamed to Fluent UI, gives elements or provides elements that are gonna to adhere to the Office branding so that your add-in looks like the hosting add-in, um, so it looks very familiar to your end users. It doesn't look like a third-party thing. Now, it consists of two primary components. It consists of Fabric Core and Fabric React. Fabric Core, think of that as just like CSS. You can have access to the font, colors and icons that are used inside of the Office app. So it adheres to the same, you can make sure that you're working with things that look like the same theme of the hosting app. Um, Fabric React, these are core elements that add input and navigation and notification components and a lot more things um, as well. Now these are only available when you're using the React web framework when creating your uh, Office add-in. Um, there are multiple labs that are I'm going to reference in the notes that accompany this lesson that you can run through to see what kinds of things you should know uh, and how much detail that you're going to get into uh, with these different um, with the, the Office uh, UI fabric. There's not a lot of questions about the Office UI fabric on the exam. There's some questions, but there's not a ton of questions. Um, it's more or less just like what are the different objects that are available to us with Fabric React and then what kinds of things does Fabric Core contain? And again, font icons and color. We don't need to go too deep in there and know like exactly how to use it and stuff like that, okay? Now, how do we use Microsoft Graph when working with add-ins? There's a couple different things you need to know about this. Um, Microsoft Graph is gonna enable us to have access to users' data in Microsoft 365 services. It's the easiest way to do it because it's essentially a proxy to all the other um, endpoints that are available to us in Microsoft 365. So it enables us to do a lot of different things. It enables us to interact with files in OneDrive, receive email attachments, get user profile information, and interact with other Microsoft 365 services um, as well, such as 
Microsoft Teams and SharePoint. Now, the one requirement is that every time you make a request to Microsoft Graph, the request has to be authorized. And the way you do that is to include a access token in the request of your, um, or in the header of your request. So a couple things you need to think about when you do this is that how am I gonna authorize the current user to, to get that token? Um, because the user's got to be authorized or the, the request that's being made the add-in has to be authorized to act on that user's behalf. So in order to do this, you're gonna to have to obtain an access token by signing into Azure AD. And I talked a little bit about that, how you can, the different authentication options inside of when we talked about the Outlook capabilities in a previous lesson, um, but refer to the notes that I have uh, in the lessons in the, in, that has accompanied this lesson about how to go obtain an access token to go talk to Microsoft Graph because there's a lot of good documentation um, in the Microsoft uh, developer docs that talk about you how to obtain an access token to call Microsoft Graph from your um, uh, from your your add-ins. Um, one of the challenges you're going to run into at this though that you need to, you, this is and you will be tested on this. You need to understand this concept. Azure AD doesn't allow its sign-in page to be open from within an iframe. Well, that's actually how all add-ins are implemented. They're just iframes inside of an Office client application. So what that means is that when my add-in launches a dialog for you to log in, it's gonna be, or when it, when, it, when it has you go log in, I can't redirect you to the login because you're gonna be inside of an iframe. So what I'm gonna to have to do is leverage the Office JS dialog API to display the login form, get you to log in, get the access token, and then save that in my in one of the settings options that I have for use later in my task pane or content pane or whatever. All right. Um, and I've covered all the different options that are available to us to do that. Now you can use any of the existing methods to authenticate and obtain the access token from Azure AD, both the ones that I've already covered but there's a lot of libraries that make your life a lot easier. If your add-in got, has got a server-side component to it and you're make, you wanna make your calls from the server side, if it's .NET based, you're gonna use msal.net, Microsoft Authentication Library.net. If it's node based, you wanna go look at the documentation that they have for this because you wanna use what's called Passport Azure AD. Passport's a very common and very popular authentication um, uh, middleware for Node.js ba node based applications. If you're doing something that is completely client side, you're gonna to want to uh, use msal.js, the, the JavaScript version of Microsoft Authentication Library. Now, you wanna pay attention uh, to what's covered in the Microsoft Identity Workload chapter of, this, of this, uh, this course, specifically around the implicit flow and the auth code flow. I'm gonna just talk about it very briefly here, but I want you to make sure that you pay attention to it inside the Microsoft Identity chapter. Uh, when the exam was written, uh, it was in late 2019. It was refreshed again in November of 2020. When it was first written, the only client-side way of authenticating uh, with msal.js, which was msal.js v1, uh, was using the implicit flow, all right? That's the implicit flow, of, it's an OAuth 2 flow of how you can go obtain an access token. However, in the middle of 2020, Microsoft updated msal.js in Azure AD so that now msal.js v2 now supports for a fully client-side solution, no server-side component to it, the auth code flow, which was usually only used in a server-side based implementation. It's more secure and it's the, the approach that Microsoft wants to recommend people use. However, with that being said, while that's true in, let's just say the real world, in the exam itself, that didn't exist when the exam was written, nor was the exam updated to include the auth code flow for client side based applications. So just keep that in mind that there may be, there, there's, you, when it, it's gonna ask you about some stuff, and it's gonna ask about the implicit flow, you wanna remember, ah, like I talked about in the overview chapter of this course, that's right, this was back from late 2019 when the Implicit flow was the way that we we're recommending everybody do this with MSAL v1, MSAL JS v1. I do have a lab um, that I'm going to reference inside the notes that accompany this lesson uh, that is going to walk you through how to work with Microsoft Graph from a um, 
uh, an Office add-in um, that you can create. So if you haven't done that works with Microsoft Graph with an Office add-in, I have a lab that's gonna walk you through it. That's gonna give you a good amount of experience uh, to be ready for the exam. Okay, now we've covered all the different capabilities from the different uh, um, Office JS API and from each of the different workloads and the different add-in types that we can create and some fundamental components. The next thing that we need to learn is how do I test, debug, and deploy my Office add-ins? And that is in the next lesson. Now, let's change our discussion from what types of Office add-ins we can build, their capabilities, and how you can build them to switch and focus more on the process of actually building these things. Now, in this lesson, I'm gonna cover the aspects of testing and debugging and deploying your custom add-ins that the exam is gonna measure you on. I'm gonna start with deployment because Sounds kind of weird, but you really need to know how to get your add-in running in order to test and debug it. Because unlike traditional console or web apps, you need to be able to test your add-in running within a client, an Office client, as that's really the only way that the Office JS API is going to work. So let's dive in. Now, there are multiple options for deploying uh, Office add-ins. Some are more applicable to testing environments. Others are more applicable only to production deployments. So you should be available or should be uh, aware and uh, understand all of the different scenarios under which they apply and when you would choose one over another one. You will be tested on this. So you need to know what options are available and when you would use them, all right? There are a couple different things you need to look at here. We've got the side load, the centralized deployment, the SharePoint catalog, app source, exchange server, and a network share. Let me explain each one of these. What is side loading? Side loading is when I'm going to install my add-in locally, and it's great for debugging. It's like the, the best option for you for debugging. So this is really when you're doing your development. This is when you're going to create your add-in, you're going to go into Outlook and you're going to, or Word or Excel or whatever, and you're actually going to have it install an add-in and you're going to actually find the manifest file and select it. And then you're gonna spin up your web server on the side um, that contains your add-in, and then your add-in's just going to go ahead and load. Um, there are options for even doing side load uh, installs with uh, Word and Excel on an iPad. Now, you all, the second option is centralized deployment. Now, this is where you're gonna deploy your add-in to your entire organization through the Microsoft 365 Admin Center but this is only really intended to be used and really only works within an organization in Microsoft 365 or in a hybrid environment. This is not really designed to be used as like a public distribution model. Um, there is another option using the SharePoint catalog. Um, it's a little limiting in the sense that it only works for Excel, Word, PowerPoint, and it only works on Windows environments. It will not work for Mac OS or web environments. So the way this works is you distribute it via the SharePoint Tenants app catalog, um, and you can, uh, it's good for when you want a dis distribute a task pane or a content add-in that's, that's ready for use within an organization in an on-prem environment. So if you're not in Microsoft 365, this would be a good option for you if it's, if you're say on-prem and Windows only. Um, and you want to even add in this a Word or Excel one or PowerPoint. The, the next option, the fourth option is AppSource. So what AppSource is, this is like Microsoft's public uh, store. Um, this is when you want to distribute your add-in for the public to be able to download and install uh, inside of uh, their office clients. There are some requirements around this. I'll talk a little bit about that uh, later on in this lesson. The second to last option is an exchange server. So what an exchange server option is, this is when you wanna distribute your application to your users via exchange. This is good when you have an Outlook ready add-in for use in an org where the environment does not have the Azure AD identity service. So just a minute ago, I talked about the SharePoint catalog option. This is a good option for uh, when you wanna deploy an Outlook add-in, but you do it through exchange whereas Word, Excel, and PowerPoint ones can be done through the SharePoint catalog option. Your last option is the network share. And what this is done, the way this works is that you make your add-in available via a network share that everyone in your organization can get to, but it only is applicable to a Windows environment. 
and it really is only intended for an on-prem environment as well. So these are all of your different options that you have available to you. You just need to keep in mind the different scenarios of when each one makes the most sense. Now let's talk about testing your add-in. Well, to be able to test it, you first have to get it loaded and run within an Office client. And I think that you, the best way to do this is gonna be with the side load option. And that's the one that Microsoft is gonna push you towards when you're doing any of your testing. Now, side loading is the most common option because it's available in all the platforms, Windows, Mac OS, web clients, and it's also applicable to Word and Excel um, on, a, um, uh, on an iPad. So you can get like, you know, full coverage with this. Now, after you install the add-in via side loading, you're gonna start the web server manually that hosts your add-in project. So the web app that contains all the web stuff that's gonna load inside the task pane or the content pane, that's gonna get loaded in separately. Um, now, once you've installed it via the side load, you then need to start at the web server for your add-in project, which is what I just said. Now, that wh what you're going to do with that, that depends on how you've built it. Like, if it's done with .NET, you're going to be spinning up a local IIS server. If you've done it using the Yeoman generator, it's probably going to be Node.js based um, uh, web server um, as well. Now, if your add-in is intended for private use, you want to make sure that you test it in all the platforms that you are going to support, right? So if you support it in like in, uh, just on Windows or Windows and Mac, make sure you test it for those. Also, consider testing it for all the different versions of the Office client that where it could be supported. Maybe it's an add-in that works in both uses um, capabilities in Word 2019 and Word 2016. Make sure you test both of those and make sure you, you know how it works. You should refer to the references that I'm gonna include in the notes here for, that are coming this lesson for more details on when you want to use it for public use. And that's when you would, you would be distributing it to AppSource. Um, you're not gonna get tested on this, but you just need to make sure you're familiar with the different things that you, that are um, the different options that are available to you and the different requirements that are there. The big thing you need to know about with AppSource is that there are two types of validation. There's gonna be a validation that's gonna happen with your manifest, and then there's gonna be a validation that's gonna happen with the code where Microsoft is gonna to have to review your add-in before they approve it for, you, for public use or for public consumption. Now, let's talk about debugging your add-in. You got a lot of options that are available to you here. Now, of course, of all the different options that are available to you, um, you're gonna have access to all the typical logging options. So like for a server side part of the app, you can use all the existing tools like logging to the console, uh, writing log files, stuff like that. For client side based applications, you're gonna have access to the console.log method to write to the browser's JavaScript console. Um, the web browser, um, you can also use the web browser's built-in tools, uh, development tools that are available to us um, as well. If you're using Visual Studio, if you create the add-in using Visual Studio for, for Windows or on Windows, the F5 experience can launch and sideload an add-in at, at, and for some of the Office clients like Word and Excel. So this experience is also gonna support breakpoints and it is a good experience because it's nice F5 development experience. But for those cases where you built an add-in using VS Code, you can use it to debug, you can also use that to debug custom functions in Excel in addition to debugging Word and Excel and Outlook based add-ins. You're, while you're free to attach to the server side component for debugging, you can also install something called the Microsoft Office Add-in Debugger Extension to debug your Office add-in against when you're using Edge um, as your runtime. But that only works if you're on Windows. It doesn't work if you're on uh, Mac or web. Now, different platforms are also gonna have different options. Uh, for debugging across your apps. Take a look at the notes that accompany this lesson because I'm gonna point you to a Microsoft document uh, in the Microsoft Developer Docs that details each of the different options because there's a pretty big matrix there and they do change uh, uh, every once in a while. So you should be aware of like what the latest things that are that are available um, to you. Um, you can also enable runtime uh, logging and to find uh, debug details that are not picked up uh, when validating the manifest. So this is really useful for like Excel custom functions and add-ins as well. Um, and then th there's a, a line that you end up running, uh, go refer to the notes that I have in the, 
for this lesson um, that I've got a line there that'll show you like how to go through and turn that on. Um, and then the other option you have for debugging is to validate the manifest. And I've already covered that uh, in another lesson uh, within this chapter. Okay, so at this point, um, I've covered everything I want to cover with Office add-ins. The next topic we're going to focus on in this lesson is the last one, and that is adaptive cards and actionable messages. So I will see you in the next lesson to talk about those topics. Now, so far in this chapter, all I focused on are Office add-ins, but the extend Office workload or section of the exam is more than just Office add-ins. The other technology in the exam that's going to be covered um, is the workload in this workload uh, or this pool of questions for this workload is adaptive cards and actionable messages. So let's look at what these are. Now, adaptive cards is an open exchange format that enables developers to exchange a, in a common and consistent manner. And effectively what it is, is a JSON structure that defines what the UI is supposed to look like and then any of the different apps that support adaptive cards can render it how they see fit. This can be done inside of Teams, inside of Outlook. It can be done, uh, Skype does it as well. Uh, Windows does it as part of the timeline feature. There's a lot of different ways you can do it. And then there's APIs and SDKs that you can use to implement it in your own applications, like a web app if you wanted to. Um, this is an open format that anybody can end up uh, leveraging here. Um, it's also supported on multiple, multiple platforms. Now, while this can be used on a lot of different platforms and a lot of different hosts, like I said, like Skype and Windows, with respect to the Microsoft or the MS 600 exam, you only care about it for Microsoft Teams and Outlook. Those are the only two places that you're gonna be tested on in this context. Now, the JSON structure for this thing um, is, gonna, is gonna define all the components of a card. You've got th four main sections. You've got elements, which are like text blocks and media or media sources. You've got containers. So you'd have like say a bunch of actions inside of a set or you have another container that contains a container. Um, you can have a column set. So if you have a bunch of columns, you have a set of columns. You can have a fact set. So it's kind of like a, kind of like a name value pairs kind of going on back and forth. And then you can also have a, a set of images or multiple images inside of a container. Um, you then have actions that you can do and the different actions that we can do on a, on a card are things like opening up a URL, submitting a form, showing another card. So you may have a, you know, an action where you click a button that actually triggers another card to be displayed. Um, toggling the visibility of a card uh, or an element or, and also uh, the target element is part of that as well. The fourth option or the fourth type that we have are things called inputs. And what an input is, is that's like collecting text or numbers or dates, times, toggles. There's a bunch of different options there. The hosting app is gonna decide how the card is gonna get rendered and what and how they support it. So like in Teams, it's used in messages, either by people or by bots, and it's used as task modules as well. And we can refresh or update cards after they've been submitted. In Outlook, we can also use it as the definition of how an actual message is defined. And this can be like refreshed or updated um, as well. Now, one of the things you should be aware of here um, about these uh, adaptive cards is that there's a thing called the adaptive card designer. And this is a screenshot of what you're gonna see. So in the top left of this panel um, that you see here, or the screenshot, you can see a preview of the card um, that is, uh, that's being authored. You can see the structure of the card in a panel in the middle. And at the bottom, you can see the payload editor. This tool gets updated frequently, and so it may not look like this when you go look at it today, um, but they're always adding new capabilities and features to the um, adaptive card designer. Um, you can see there a little bit of what like a, an adaptive card looks like um, at the bottom, but at, let me show you another one. Here's a reference of, of what an adaptive card looks like. So you see here, there's really two, property, two or three properties at the very top where there's a schema, a type, a version, and a body. The body is the main part of the card. So in the body, we have a container, and in that container, it's going to contain items inside, or uh, the body is a container, and it's going to contain items. In this case here, I just have one uh, thing, which is a text block, and it's got bolded text that's going to be medium-sized, and the text that's going to be displayed is the word Mars. 
then you can see I have another element, another container in the body, and that is going to be another collection of things. So here I've got like uh, the idea of it is the planet summary, the type is a text block, and then there's some text that I'm uh, writing out about describing what Mars is. And then I've created an action section as well for the body. And down at the bottom here, you can see that I've created an action. So when someone clicks on my action button, it's going to open a URL to point to the Wiki, uh, Wikipedia link for um, Mars the planet. Um, and the title that's going to be on that, uh, on that button is Learn More on Wikipedia. So that's an example of what you would see what an adaptive card would look like. So that's what adaptive cards are. Now let me talk about actionable messages. Actionable messages is an outlook technology. And what this does is it replaces or enhances an HTML email body with an adaptive card. It supports the ability to refresh a card as well using an existing card in a message. So like for example, if I get an email message and it has a like the card has an approval request, it may show me some information about the item and allow me to approve or reject it straight from the card itself. And when I do that, when I when I approve or reject it, it'll submit that back to some backend service who can then send a message back to say, go update the card with this new card to show that it's been approved or rejected. I'll talk about that in just a minute a little bit more. Now these cards, these actionable messages, they have to be registered in something called the Actionable Email Developer Dashboard. And this is gonna specify one or more static email addresses that are used as the sender of the email. And it's gonna specify one or more endpoints that will be used to invoke actions in the message. Um, it's also going to include the scope of the submission as well, uh, and it's going to dictate um, the set of um, the set of recipients um, that can retrieve the actual messages uh, from the solution. So, a couple different options we have there. I've got my mailbox is one option that's good for testing, and whenever I, I use that or specify that one, those are automatically approved. Um, I also have test users. Uh, so that's good, for, again, for testing. And again, that's also automatically approved. But if I choose organization, um, that is where I can send one of these messages to anybody in my org um, within the same Microsoft 365 org. And that's common in like a line of business app. These only have to be approved by the exchange admins in my tenant. The other option is a global scope, and that can be sent to anybody, but these have to be submitted to Microsoft for testing, validation, and approval because the receiver is gonna be trusting the stuff that's coming from Microsoft in the message. Now, there are some requirements of the sender of these. Um, the email address must originate from an email server that implements things called DKIM and SPF industry standards. So DKIM stands for Domain Keys Identified Mail, and SPF is the sender policy framework. These are two very common industry standards that are used to make sure that people aren't spoofing email addresses uh, and to do an extra bit of validation. So Microsoft requires that the email server implement these. Um, actionable messages, uh, the, the JSON that's being sent as the adaptive card that's being sent as an actionable message, it must be signed using the JSON web signature, JWS, and it must be signed with the private key that corresponds with the public key that was included in the actionable message registration on the email developer dashboard that I talked about earlier. So here's uh, an example of an adaptive card that's included in an email message. And so this is considered an actionable message. Outlook is rendering the message as an adaptive card. Um, in, in the actual email. So you can see there, it's a, a thing to kind of prompt the user to say, thank you for attending the webinar, and it's asking them for some feedback. Now, wouldn't it be cool if we could actually refresh this? And you can, so let's talk about what that is. Uh, we'll talk about that in just a minute. Instead, let's look at what this looks like. So the body of the email that was sent to this user, the, it, it contains all the normal stuff you would see in an HTML-based email, except Notice that script tag that I've highlighted. The type is application slash adaptive card plus JSON. And then I would stick where that curly bracket zero placeholder is, I would stick the adaptive card in right there. And that's what's gonna tell Outlook to render this adaptive card. Now, what if someone submitted that, uh, that adaptive card 
what do I do with that? Well, I'm gonna have a server that's gonna receive the request. And one of the cool things about this is, is that a developer can host the service that can respond to the card submit action and respond optionally with an adaptive card. It could just respond with a message or a status code, but you can also respond with an adaptive card. What Outlook will do is it will replace the existing card in the actionable message with the new card and the, the rendered new card. And it's not just doing that real time, it's also gonna do that for all future views of the email that contains the card. A couple scenarios that, where, this would make, where this would be useful, um, you, and you'll be tested on some of these, uh, just like what, when would be a good option for this. Sending a survey to a group and allow them to quickly respond to the email message itself without having to browse or log into a website. Maybe quickly approve a, a code check-in or a pull request or an expense report or a vacation request. Maybe adding actions to an automated email that a service desk ticketing system is used to send to email uh, to employees responsible for handling service requests. And these actions could allow for employees to assign, redirect, or add notes to uh, the ticket. Now you wanna make sure you protect this service that receives and responds to these actions from actionable messages. And there's a couple things that Microsoft has done to make this easier. You, you need to know these for the exam. All posts that come from Microsoft are gonna include an authorization header and a JWT, a, a JOT token that's been signed by Microsoft that also includes claims that the service should validate. If they're validated, you can assume that it's a valid message that originated from Microsoft. So you know that it came from an adaptive card or an actual message that was registered and approved by Microsoft or by an Exchange admin. The token is also gonna include the identity of the recipient who initiated the action, so the person that was looking at the email, and when the service responds, it must respond via a post with, if it's gonna respond with a, with a card, it must respond with a post that includes the new card. Now your service is gonna to respond to Microsoft 365 with using HTTP status codes and headers to indicate the submission was successful or if it failed, and optionally with a status message um, as well. Furthermore, you can also include in the body of the message, you can include a new, adapt, a new uh, adaptive card that will be used to replace the existing one. The header value called card action status, that is gonna be used to provide a friendly message to the user which can contain details on the error or a success message. The header uh, is uh, the other header value called card update and body. This is a Boolean value that's gonna be used to tell Outlook if it should update the existing card that's in, in the message with the card that's included in this response's payload. So you would include that in the body of the response. So what does that look like? So here's what it would look like if I had responded with that card, uh, with a new card, back to the request from someone who's filled out uh, that, last, uh, uh, that last bit of feedback here. You can see the last bit of feedback. I'm showing the last four uh, results at the average rating of the last uh, five people responded, and it shows me the, last, uh, the most recent response, which was typed in by uh, Megan Bowen. All right, so that is everything that you're gonna need to know uh, about uh, to be prepared for the Office 365 or the, the extending office um, uh, workload section of the MS 600 exam. Again, a couple of bit of tips here when you're preparing for this, for this exam or for this section of the exam. If I went through things in this lesson or in this chapter that were familiar to you and you felt like you knew them fairly well, then you probably don't need to study those things. But I gave you some additional resources to go refresh or to make sure that you are confirmed that you actually do know those things. Um, however, if I went through something during this lesson, uh, during this chapter, and you weren't terribly familiar with it, or it was something new, uh, the only things I covered here are things that are gonna be on the exam. Nothing more, nothing less. So if it wasn't familiar to you, I'd recommend you use the resources that I've provided to either just go read the docs, or probably I, pr I would prefer you to do this to give you a better chance at at being a little more experienced with it uh, is taking some time and doing some of the hands-on labs that cover the things that may not be uh, as familiar. And like I said, throughout the, every, every lesson in this chapter, I have included notes that accompany each lesson 
and, and referencing the hands-on labs that and, and referencing the things that the hands-on labs also cover so that you can know, is it worth my while to go take the time uh, to go do this lab? All right, so with that, I hope you do well on this section of the exam. And we've got other uh, chapters in this course that cover all the other sections and workloads of the exam. So I wish you the best of luck in taking the exam. If you have any questions about what I've conveyed here, please drop a comment below or let me know if you want to see more videos about office add-in development or something else by dropping a comment below. If you like this video, please give me a thumbs up and subscribe by smashing that big red subscribe button below the video so you'll see when I publish more videos for web and cloud developers on Microsoft 365 and Microsoft Azure topics. I'm Andrew Connell again. Thanks for watching. I hope to see you next time.